Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody listening whenever and wherever this episode may find you. To all the people from the future, please note spoiler alerts. Today, I welcome Professor Nathan Schneider from the University of Colorado. He is a very interesting person. We obviously disagree. He comes from a different side of the political spectrum uh, than myself, but he is a very thoughtful and a very intelligent person. I came across his name and his writings after I was talking to uh, Gabrielle Coleman, uh, a digital anthropologist who I'm trying to get on the show. We uh, have just been having issues as far as our schedules lining up, but she recommended Nathan uh, to, to talk to him. And so I started to read all of his work and he obviously comes from a completely different uh, spectrum than myself. He is not a libertarian. He is not an Austrian school of economics type person. He is very much on the progressive, uh, probably I would say more on the democratic socialist left. Maybe uh, you could you could classify that. I, I really didn't dig down and ask him what his his exact um, politics were, but I, I would probably from from the feelings that I get, I would say that he's probably more on that that end. I think it's very important to talk to people that you don't agree with, and to you know get to know what you know other people who are looking at bitcoin think because we will not spread bitcoin into mass culture if we don't understand the varying subsets of culture that we are trying to evangelize to right it's you know bitcoin in the same way is very much as i've kind of talked about as of late very much as as a faith and if you're trying to evangelize a faith to other people um, you know, a company, a corporation are, are operating the same way. If you don't understand the language, if you don't understand the symbolism um, and what people in these different subsets, you know, find important, you're never going to be able to evangelize to them and you're never going to get them to agree with you. So this was just another one of my many conversations of trying to understand people of different, uh, where their minds at, where, uh, people of different political and, and social groupings. And I find it to be very useful. I think that he does have some valid criticisms of, of Bitcoin. I don't agree, but I think they are valid in terms of that. Uh, they, they are problems that people see and these things maybe need to be addressed. I may not have addressed them as well as I wanted to. But but anyways, these, this is just a continued conversation. I really enjoyed this episode. But uh, f- before we get to it, I was wondering if you could do me a quick favor. Go to iTunes, leave a five-star and a written review. It really, really does help, and I appreciate it. Uh, I do not appreciate uh, as much the people who, for whatever reason, I may have uh, disagreed with on Twitter, who left one-star reviews lately. Uh, a couple of those popped up and really kind of dumbed down the overall rating of the podcast so if those of you who are listening could do me a quick favor go over and leave that five star review and a written um, review as well to really kind of bump our stats back up as far as for the uh, full out ratings it does help when people are searching for something like a bitcoin podcast or whatever in itunes if you could also go over to etoro Go to digunocrypto.com slash etoro. That's digunocrypto.com slash E-T-O-R-O. They are a a Bitcoin and a fiat trading exchange. They've got some really, really cool things such as social trading. You can follow the most popular, the most successful traders out there. See what they're trading. See their positions. And uh, and, uh, very soon you're going to be able to copy trade them exactly as they make trades in real time. They have they predate Bitcoin. They've been around for longer than Bitcoin ever has, or since Bitcoin uh, before Bitcoin existed. And they offer very uh, various types of cryptocurrencies to trade, as well as fiat. And and uh, they're just an overall great company. And you know, like I've said in past episodes, if I'm going to uh, promote a company, I'm vouching for them. So I do vouch for eToro. So head over to. Did you know crypto.com slash eToro? And please use that link because that link lets them know that you heard about it here on the podcast. So one last thing, I'd like to thank you, whoever is listening to this right now, without you listening, without you participating, uh, you know, I would not be able to do any of this and this would not be a worthwhile effort. So I really 
appreciate it from the bottom of my heart that the fact that you are listening, subscribing to the podcast, and enjoy the show. I'm excited to welcome Nathan Schneider, Assistant Professor of Media Studies for the University of Colorado Boulder, journalist and author of scholarly articles such as Decentralization, An Incomplete Ambition, as well as an author of numerous books, including God and Proof, and your latest one, which is Everything for Everyone, The Radical Tradition That is Shaping the Next Economy. Nathan, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. And you've written quite a few articles over the years on Bitcoin and kind of the larger uh, uh, cryptocurrency space and as well as kind of digital culture and hacktivism as well. But first, I was wondering if you'd like to kind of go over your background, um, how you kind of got into, you know, the the uh, the hacktivist, the digital culture, um, and, you know, this kind of story that brought you into, you know, where you find yourself now. Uh, well, one could start in, in a lot of different places, but, you know, maybe a useful one for this context is um, when I first heard of Bitcoin, which was at a um, at an Occupy Wall Street event in 2012. So in the in the spring after the fall occupation and um, someone who I'd come to become friends with now a collaborator named Devin Balkind of an organization called Serapis. Um, you know, came up to me and said, you know, look, this protest stuff is nice, you know, which I've been covering pretty intensively over the last uh, number of months. Uh, but something really important has just happened, uh, just happened a few years ago, it's starting to take off where, you know, this, and then he just went blah, 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 <laughs> as far as I could tell. Um, but, uh, you know, essentially explaining that um, the uh, possibility of this kind of um, decentralized money um, uh, had now become possible. Uh, had now become real and this was going to really take off. And, and I was kind of not interested. I'm not like a money person. Occupy was for instance, full of people who, you know, certain set of people who were like very fixed on the idea that the big problem with the whole system is like the nature of the money system. Um, and, you know, I think there's some truth to that, but to me, the politics and the power distributions and the, um, and so forth are, are much more kind of clear and present. And, um, and the idea of fixating on like where the money supply comes from was not interesting. It was really only in um, January of 2014 when I was touring uh, for uh, that, that book based on Occupy called Thank You Anarchy. Um, I was in San Francisco, an old friend of mine, you know, kind of similarly took me aside and said something really important has just happened. Um, and he was talking about the Ethereum white paper by Vitalik Buterin. And that was something that really got my attention because now we weren't just talking about money. We were talking about, about perhaps the future of democracy, the future of governance, the possibility that people could um, create the social contracts of the future and code. Yeah, and that's uh, you know very interesting. I was you know, reading a lot of uh, in preparation for the for the interview, um, a lot of your older articles and and just kind of um, uh, you know starting kind of basically as as Occupy had uh, you know really started to kick off is is kind of where I picked up with a lot of your writing, and it, that was a really interesting moment. It was kind of a very uh, you know, a synchronicity that that right as the, you know, the 08 recession was hitting, Occupy was was kicking off uh, that that Bitcoin at the same time, like all these things were were just kind of jumping on onto the world stage. Um, and it's not that Bitcoin itself was was planned that way or was, you know, fast tracked. Um, you know, Satoshi didn't fast track it to be that. It was just, it was a very interesting kind of confluence that all this kind of came together at the same time. Um, but, you know, you mentioned uh, Ethereum and I know that, that you've that you've taken an interest in a lot of other um, uh, different uh, blockchain projects, but, uh, you know, what is your current thoughts on Bitcoin? Like you said, you know, you, you were kind of less concerned uh, with, with the, the creation of money. Uh, but I, I was wondering, what is your thoughts on Bitcoin currently and 
you know, um, I, I think this is also an important question uh, for to kind of understand people's perspective is what is Bitcoin to you? Uh, Bitcoin is to me mainly a um, really fascinating and um, uh, and telling experiment uh, uh, and also a very naive one in certain respects. Uh, it's a it's a, a system for digital money that was designed with certain kind of threat models in mind, certain kinds of assumptions in mind about what a good money system should look like and about the kinds of um, incentives that would be involved in that. And, you know, on the one hand, it's remarkable the degree to which this has been successful. I mean, for years, you know, before and after that, I've seen experiments in, um, uh, in alternative currencies of various sorts that just don't get the, the economics together uh, to take off. You know, they don't become useful to people. They don't become something that people actually want for, for good or bad reasons. Um, Bitcoin, for both good and bad reasons, maybe, um, has become something, uh, uh, you know, much more than any, you know, non-governmental currency we've seen in, in, in quite a while, uh, become something that people want. Um, and that in itself offers some tremendous lessons. Um, at the same time, one of the things that, um, you know, I've been, I've been studying and, and observing in my research is the way in which the kind of promises and aspirations of decentralization of participant control um you know have have run into trouble right i mean we see um we've seen you know even more in previous times than now you know highly centralized mining which means highly centralized governance um you have uh, uh, a system that uh, has run into a number of cliffs that it has had to somehow deal with. Um, clearly, there were certain design features of the early versions that just did not um, map on to, to experience. And, um, and among a lot of the challenges that the Bitcoin system has faced, um, you know, that governance um, framework that was established in the earliest versions has, you know, I would say really not been adequate. Um, it's not allowed for the kind of rapid iteration and, and adaptation to new circumstances that, you know, I would argue the, um, the system probably needed in order to fulfill all the dreams of the people, um, uh, uh, that people hold for it. Um, and then second, you know, when I just personally, you know, thinking about the kinds of systems I would want to have with, uh, you know, have as our shared infrastructure, um, I, I'm not sure that it has quite reached the ambition, even the basic ambition of improving on something like the um, the uh, the central banks as a issuer of currency. I mean, for instance, I'm not sure that um, uh, handing power over to a group of miners who happen to have access to uh, low cost electricity and high tech equipment um, is necessarily better than handing it over to uh, a central bank that's controlled by commercial banks plus um, some uh, uh, significant oversight uh, that comes through uh, elected officials uh, who are, you know, accountable to pop popular electoral systems. Um, I, I don't think we've, you know, if, if I were to choose, unfortunately, I would still probably opt for the Federal Reserve rather than um, whoever happens to be running the major Bitcoin mining pools right now. Um, and, you know, but that hopefully should spur us to thinking about the next steps. Um, you know, what kinds of systems could be better accountable uh, uh, and that could actually advance on both something like the Federal Reserve and, um, and you know, the current state of, of something like Bitcoin? I would, yeah, I mean, obviously, I... Um... I, I would disagree uh, with with aspects. I, I, for for one, I would, I, I because a lot of your writing is, is focused on and and from your uh, political perspective is focused on um, you know inequality in the financial system, and I, I think that, and this is one of the other things I wanted to ask is because I I've been trying to basically get outside of, of the bubbles that I often find myself in both Bitcoin, uh, which is kind of heavily, 
libertarian in a sense, and then libertarian as far as for, you know, the non-Bitcoin political circles that I run in as well, because it, it doesn't do me any good if I don't ever sharpen my arguments um, or, or never challenged, right? Um, but one of the, on the topic of financial uh, or inequality in the financial system, um, one of the things I, I often don't hear um, from the left um, and, and progressives a lot of times is that, you know, the, the role that the central bank policies do play in that, the devaluation of money via inflation and the monetization of the debt, and especially the fact that the way that current central banks operate is where they basically just can print off, you know, money uh, and monetize it via bonds, and then they loan these out basically to the larger commercial banks at, you know, sub 1% uh, interest rates. Uh, and the banks turn around and loan this out, you know, at three, six, nine, twelve percent, depending on what kind of instruments we're talking about. Um, whereas with Bitcoin, this is not it's not that you couldn't maybe do something like that, but that money creation, um, the closer you are to the creation of money, you know, the more value it has. And the vast majority of the population of the world is on the wrong side of of that um, that policy, not to mention all the kinds of things where you talk about central bank policies of, of the ability to fund, you know, unending wars and things like that as well. I, I, I mean, um, we could probably talk for a very long time on all those different things you brought up, but as far as for central banks, I, I, I still don't, uh, I, that, that would probably be the one that I, uh, I disagree most heavily with. And that's fine. Um, I, I think it's, it's a, it's a healthy conversation to have about, you know, what is the accountability structure that's appropriate for a money system, and uh, uh, and and I think that there is a, uh, but you know both systems have um, an interesting set of stakeholders, right? You know, and and the the stakeholders are are really relevant here. You know, who are the who are the stakeholders who actually have control over the system, and who are the stakeholders who we would want to have control over our money supply and our and and uh, the the way in much in which money works, especially when we think of money as this kind of now pro programmable thing that is not just you know a metaphor for gold or something like that, you know, uh, but actually becomes much more fluid and flexible and dynamic. Um, you know, who who controls that? What are the mechanisms that we are using? And, you know, you, you can look at different models like the, you know, the Bitcoin model is one answer to that. And that's saying that the, the, the people who have a tremendous financial stake in the system should have control over it and it should have certain fixed rules. So there's certain things that they can't do um, and certain things that they're going to be incentivized not to do um, in the, um, you know, in the, in the uh, fiat system. There is a kind of uh, uh, potentially democratic elasticity with, you know, an, a, a, a kind of dangerous relationship with these commercial banks, you know. But but there is the the argument that potentially social outcomes could outweigh just, you know, the kind of fixed supply logic that you could say, hey, this is something that's socially good, so we're going to expand the money supply to meet that social need. Unfortunately, that power is often used for, as you as you said, um, uh, uh, military purposes and so forth, which is uh, certainly something I'd I'd um, uh, contest. But but nevertheless, there is that kind of uh, there's a different kind of stakeholder relationship and a different kind of flexibility. You could even look at a case like Libra, you know, the new Facebook proposal, um, which has a you know a different kind of model where. A certain set of stakeholders are allowed into the Libra Association, and they get to um, control that money supply. Um, you know, it's an it's an interesting structure. It's kind of, in a way, a blend between the two in certain respects. Um, uh, uh, but it just uh, opens up a bigger question that I would like to ask and keep asking, which is, um, what uh, uh, what would we actually like to see? And, you know, I hope that Bitcoin, you know, as a, you know, early experiment in, um, in, in crypto economics and in this whole idea of a decentralized uh, blockchain uh, system is only the beginning. Um, and, you know, I get a little concerned that just that first experiment becomes, you know, a kind of end all be all. 
um, uh, rather than just the start for a broader conversation of what do we really want the social contract to the future to look like. No, and that that's a that's a, that's a very good point. I, I think that most Bitcoiners would agree that if there was something that that came um, later that did what Bitcoin does but better and and uh, satisfies a lot of um, or all all the same the same issues that there there wouldn't be a necessarily although there may be some uh, a cognitive issues you know as far as for uh, uh, you know mental loyalty or whatever but. Um, I, I think that, you know, one of the things I've been looking into and pondering more as what you just kind of mentioned as far as for um, a new, you know, co th these conversations about the new social contract. And I think that's one of the things that that Bitcoin did. And one of the the effects of Bitcoin that we're just starting to understand now is that it broke a lot of mental barriers and I in my, in my last episode, I, I I talked about it and I still haven't found the term. I don't know. Maybe you, you'll know what I'm talking about, where there's a uh, th there's this mental effect that people will think something's impossible. Right. Uh, the example I gave was like the 1080 on the snowboard. Uh, and then once that was done the first time and everyone saw that it was possible, what hadn't ever been done before now becomes Com more common you know this guy starts to do it and then you know 10 other people are able to do it and and um I, I can't remember the specific name for that that psychological effect it is but what i think what bitcoin did do and it's having a larger effect is it broke uh, first is this idea that we need a centralized source to issue money for the longest time it was you know you need some sort of organization to you know, mint currency, whether it's private or um, or public, you know, run by a government. But you'll need this central institution to mint the currency and then uh, whether it's gold or whatever and send it out there. What I think Bitcoin broke um, these mental model or these mental constraints that we do need that. And I think that now we're starting to break down these concepts of, um, you know, geographic nationhood and. And as you start to see like virtual nations and, and voluntary communities starting to sprout up, um, I think you'll see that more and more, especially in the virtual space. But I think you're spot on with with the, the larger conversation that's being spurred. The, the, um, yeah, I don't, I'm not a psychologist. I don't know the name of that either. I see it every day, though, with my kids where, you know, the, the um, you know, the second one, especially uh, uh, learns, picks things up so much quicker than the first one did because there is an example to look to or the first one I remember one, you know, for the longest time, like uh, would need to get picked up out of out of his crib. And then one day um, a friend came over and just, you know, climbed right over. And then suddenly he realized, oh, I can climb right over, too. Um, and, so you know, everything changes. Our, our, our daily habits change completely um, because, you know, someone just showed him it's possible. Um, and, you know, it's something, too, that is really significant in the cooperative uh, uh, tradition that I've been focused on uh, the last few years, uh, kind of alongside this this stuff, which is a tradition of democratic, uh, uh, democratically owned and governed business. And over and over, um, it's required these experiments to demonstrate that these things were possible. So for instance, um, in the 1920s, uh, when uh, Franklin Roosevelt was um, uh, governor of New York, uh, he saw farmers in upstate New York develop their own small um, electric cooperatives to bring electricity uh, to their communities where the investor-owned utilities wouldn't go. And because of that, when he became president, he was able to imagine um, one of the most powerful um, uh, economic development programs in our country's history, uh, which was the Rural Electrification Act that, um, you know, back to things you were saying earlier, essentially granted rural communities access to bank rate loans, you know, enable them to basically act like commercial banks in the financial system, um, lend directly, borrow directly from the government and implement at large scale um, the models that he had seen at small scale. And, um, you know, within, within a pretty small number of years, uh, uh, the uh, rural America went from 10% electrified to just about 100 um, through this model, and and you know it's it, it's tremendous, and 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 you know so so I, I 
you know, I'm, I'm always kind of asking that question uh, along the lines of democracy. You know, what are the ways in which we don't even think that our uh, uh, democratic participation, involvement, you know, full, full kind of humanity is, is, is available to us? Um, so, men, so much throughout world history, we felt, you know, the need to rely on, on kings, on lords, on, you know, on all these kinds of um, dependency relationships. Um, and and it's, it's often only when we see and experience and touch, you know, uh, um, the possibility of a democratic alternative, um, whether it's in politics or in economic life, uh, do we start to realize, hey, there's a lot more that's possible here. Uh, we can really do this, you know, at scale. Um, and certainly, I think that experience of, uh, you know, I've heard so many people go blah 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 on and on and on about different money systems and so forth. And it, you know, again, this is my eyes glaze over. It's just not, it's not interesting to me. But you know, um, the the first time I I experienced, you know, trading Bitcoin, you know, before there was Coinbase and all this stuff. Um, the first time I experienced, you know, like using an exchange and going from one, uh, uh, you know, one cryptocurrency to another and, and um, you know, experiencing that kind of market dynamic, um, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it kind of it starts to change your relationship uh, with money. It gets you thinking differently about what your relationship could be. And that that opening, you're absolutely right, is, you know, it's very powerful. Yeah, you you mentioned uh, the the co-ops, the rural co-ops in in New York, and in the, the spreading of electrical power in, in rural areas, and that that's one of the uh, uh, ancillary effects that um, I was talking with a gentleman who did a uh, he helped write the report um, or write a report uh, for CoinShares on the 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 myth of of Bitcoin's uh, electrical usage. Um, and that it's 80% or so is renewable, uh, ma mainly because it, it's going along with hydro and, and it's seeking out because miners are seeking out the cheapest form of energy, right? Cheaper inputs, you know, it means you have a higher profit margin, um, on it. And what they're seeing is that there's, um, they're moving, uh, in, and, uh, and there's, there's talk of even starting to, basically go into these almost these co-ops with with these um areas in china and other places around the world where there isn't power but let's you know they have a, a river or whatever that's in the area that could produce it where they could be going into providing um you know going into deals with local governments to provide uh, power for these local areas as long as they can um siphon off a certain amount of of that power for bitcoin mining operations and and spreading that out in search of the cheapest and which is often you know uh, renewable in a sense i mean not in the sense of, of windmills or whatever but but hydro is the most efficient form um but that was kind of a, a to me a, a pretty interesting uh, development of what that could mean for a lot of areas around the world that have access to that resource but you know, don't have the means to build that infrastructure. Yeah, uh, possibly. I mean, I, 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 I don't doubt that people are doing good things with it. Um, you know, at, at, at the same time, it does seem like, um, you know, this is another example of the kind of wackiness of, of the original algorithm, like scaling up um, and uh, taking on features. You know, you know I, I suspect Satoshi's design plan probably didn't involve like generating, you know, Czechoslovakia levels amount uh, of electricity. And, you know, it's great that it's, it's renewable and that there are cool things that you can do with it. But, you know, when, it, it just seems like kind of obvious to me that it would be nicer if you could run a money system without all of this kind of unnecessary churning of, of fans and electricity and so forth. It's just a, you know, it's a, it's a reminder of how path dependent we are as humans and, and as, as, as social creatures that, you know, because of certain design features built into the system and then the probably unanticipated effects of the development of ASICs uh, after, you know, the use of GPUs and all this stuff, that this would become an industry um, rather than being something that ordinary users would do. Uh, on relatively small scales, which appeared to be the original intention, um, you know, it, it, it's 
it's just remarkable. Like, um, you know, how, 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 what, what are the decisions that we can make uh, in a system? What are the decisions that we feel stuck with? Um, right. And, 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 you know, that's why too, um, I think uh, there's a really interesting conversation starting to form that's, that's connecting our uh, blockchain protocol conversation with uh, the longer tradition of constitutional theory, you know, the, the, the theory and development of state constitutions, which have a similar characteristic. They're, they're hard to change rules um, that are built into the system and that people start getting a vested interest in. Um, and my colleague here at University of Colorado, Eric Alston, who's a, a constitutional expert, um, has now been looking at cryptocurrency systems and, and uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, their ilk, and doing some really interesting comparison work about the kinds of um, give and take that you have in a system about um, what rules are hard to, to, to change and which rules are easy to change. Um, and, you know, an example like electricity consumption is, is, you know, something worth considering there. Like, if we could change that, you know, would we want to change that? You know, Ethereum is going through this question right now about uh, moving toward a, from a proof of work to a proof of stake system. Um, uh, what are the costs of that kind of change? And, and also, really importantly, who has a vested interest in preventing uh, that sort of change? Um, you know, th there is a real danger in all of this crypto stuff, right? That when we hand our rules, the rules of our society over to code, you know, and we remove them from human institutions, um, we really become stuck with that code in important ways. And so sometimes maybe that code can be harder to change, believe it or not, than a human institution. Um, and, and I think this, this question of electricity consumption in Bitcoin is an example of that. And, and, it's a reason why in my you know, maybe recent article on decentralization, I argue that maybe we need to start thinking more intently about designing for accountable centralization alongside our decentralized systems. Um, that if we, um, it appears that a lot of these decentralized systems are enabling um, new kinds of centralization to emerge within them, like the centralization of miners in Bitcoin. Um, and, uh, and, and, and these might be unexpected, but they emerge and it might be important to have institutional counterweights to some of those unexpected emergencies, something akin to antitrust law, um, in, um, you know, in conventional, uh, state structures where if a company becomes so powerful that it dominates the market and nothing can stop it, um, that you have you know, a political force that's able to counteract that if necessary. Well, it's interesting. You talk about uh, code being maybe more difficult to change than, than human institutions. And I was, uh, I was going to switch gears with you for a little bit here is that, you know, your book, uh, uh, God and Proof, which I, I think is, is a really, really good book. It's an important one. And it, it kind of flows into uh, another kind of a, a larger kind of societal context that, that I think that we're, that we're seeing here. I'm not sure if you've listened to any of uh, John Verveke's uh, lectures on no, what he calls familiar. the meaning crisis. Uh, it, it's really, um, it's, it's a really interesting concept. And his contention is that, you know, we've seen really in the last, especially the last uh, half a century, uh, a mass of falling away in, in the West um, from traditional spiritual institutions, you know, churches, um, fraternal organizations, you know, these kind of community, um, what used to be kind of these, you know, the Rotary Clubs and Elks Clubs and all that. And that used to be the community that we lived in and which they also provided, you know, meaning in our lives, the meanings of our existence and, and why we are here. And then he also says that we, the, 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 we saw in the 20th century the attempt to kind of replace these um, traditional spiritual institutions with kind of a pseudo spiritual secular ideologies, the isms, you know, the fascisms, the communisms of the 20th century. And and that kind of the bloodshed that that resulted led many to reject that. So now we have these kind of multiple generations that have this crisis of meaning in our lives. We don't um, we find ourselves in a, a boat. Uh, or I, I should say you and I don't find ourselves in that boat. I would say we, we, we share a common faith, but many who don't 
uh, they don't want traditional re- religious, um, I'm sorry, religious institutions in the lives, but they don't want those isms associated with the, although we are starting to see kind of those things rear their ugly heads again. Um, and this crisis of meaning is manifest in, you know, drug abuse, you know, increases anxiety and depression, you know, suicides. I mean, we, we've seen a doubling of suicide rates in ages 10 to 14, which is insane. I don't understand that, you know, at that young of age, but of course, there's many different factors that contribute to that, but I think, uh, uh, but I, I kind of agree with his uh, his uh, contention that these are were the roots of this crisis and meaning that we find ourselves in the West. And your book touches on on that as far as the, you know the search for God. And I would love to hear kind of your thoughts on that on that subject. Of do you do you do you see that as well? This kind of this fulcrum point in history as we're kind of pivoting and where do you see us going from there well it's a it's a you know big uh big set of questions but um you know one of the the, the in a way the the book um god and proof you know which is a kind of history of the of the search for arguments for and, exa- and against the existence of god um uh it, you know turned out to be kind of a joke um in a good way <laughs> you know it it um you know, it, it, it probes these arguments, um, but it also puts the people making the arguments in context and in their worlds and in their lives. Um, and it, I really came away from writing that book um, with a, uh, a profound respect for the power of the social, um, the, the way in which, in which these proofs really like don't mean much without the, the social context that people experience them in. Um, and the historical context, the worlds that they make, and the communities that they're in, um, and, and 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 in my own life, I experience this very very much. You know, I, I uh, converted to Catholicism as you know in one of those kind of um, crises of meaning, right, as a teenager, uh, and and started immediately setting out in this fascination with arguments, proofs, logic. You know, how could I really anchor my newfound faith in this kind of perfect logic. And, um, and it was a, you know, it was a useful process in certain respect. I wrote a book out of it, blah, blah, blah. But it, um, it was also not a very satisfying one. And it was really much more um, uh, through the process of building communities of faith and, you know, building a family and all these things that, that, um, that the, the reality of these of these traditions and these and these um, and that faith became uh, uh, you know became uh, uh, much more tangible for me uh, and and you know th- this points to the connection you're making here between um, where we find ourselves now and the kind of dissolution of of a lot of these these strong social bonds um, and and it's really true it's it's a it's a, a real question and and I think it should be at the core of our questions about what kinds of social contracts are we looking for. Um, and, and, you know, to bring it back to um, questions about cryptocurrency, you know, one, one um, kind of core piece of terminology that has, you know, a very specific kind of technical meaning, um, but that also, you know, has a kind of uh, resonance beyond that is the idea that Bitcoin is trustless, right? That, that the, the goal um, stated in those early those early statements of Satoshi's when he was first releasing this stuff is this is a trustless system. You know, we don't need to trust. Um, the problem with human institutions is all the trust that is required to make them work. I believe is direct quote um, from one of those early um, forum posts of his, and um, and and that's an interesting diagnosis of of the problem. And the solution, of course, is to hand the trust over to the code. Um, you know, I, I think coming from the perspective of, you know, communities of, of faith and, um, and from the perspective of also the, the cooperative tradition that I've immersed myself in so much is that, you know, maybe the, the challenge is that we need to build more trust into our society. We need to help each other be more trustworthy. Um, we need to create um, uh, uh, systems of, of behavior where, you know, systems of uh, kinds of community where we can trust each other, um, and maybe 
you know, actually that trustless system that Satoshi was talking about is an, is an attempt to do that after all, you know, maybe it's, again, it's just a very specific piece of technical terminology, but nevertheless, um, you know, I, I'm concerned when we hand over things that used to be under human control to code, um, because um, out of that basic kind of spiritual conviction that, that you know, people are made in the image of God, um, I'm concerned that we're giving up something of our, of our autonomy, of our dignity when we do that. Um, and and I, I, I think it's really important to uh, be very careful when we do that, you know, we're, we're not just further atomizing each other, you know, that we're just further, that, you know, are, are we really just making ourselves more anonymous, less accountable, um, less responsible um, for the systems of our world than we used to be? And what are the, again, the social consequences of that going to be? Um, then again, and then I'll shut up. Um, what would it look like to create cryptocurrency systems, you know, using these similar kinds of technologies? Would it be useful to use these kinds of technologies um, to create systems um, that are more trustful, you know, that reverse that diagnosis and say the problem with, you know, the, the, the world around us is, is actually that um, we don't trust each other enough. I would I would tend to agree with that. I think that you know that trust and building up more of trust. I think is I think its venue is better kind of in this concept of subsidiarity, right? In the in the in the local community, um, whereas with Bitcoin, you know, being it, you know if it achieves the goal of being global money, right? It it takes that need because uh, I think the larger that you try to create, you know, that you expand trust out, the less trustworthy something becomes, right? Um, the, the, you know, the more actors in it versus when you're at the at the local, the you know, the the closest, you know, from the family unit out. Um, when you're seeing those people every day within your community, it it makes it much more difficult to be untrustworthy because you you have to face those um, the effects of that that head on. But uh, you know to to kind of go in, in when you're when you're talking about losing um, our autonomy and losing our, our sense of self as as God's creation, you know, by giving up these elements that used to be under human control, you know, my my thoughts on that were that um, a, a friend of mine, uh, Vin Armani, had, had released this uh, video talking about um, relating it to the to the to the gospel story of. Um, you, you know, going before the uh, when, when Christ was preaching and the and the, uh, um, and the Jewish scholars had come in and and they you know, you know were asking about taxation, right? Whether it's it's warranted or not, you know. And he asked for the for the coin and you know said whose face is on this and give you know render unto Caesar um, that which is Caesar's and unto God which is God's. And you know his contention, which I thought was really interesting, was that Bitcoin being you know being code, um, but the the hashing of of the network is is nothing more than just math right and and to me um you know math is universal math is um math exists whether we you know when the earliest humans before they even had a concept of of mathematics you know that that system existed right it's part of creation and to me in a way that that bitcoin is not not taking away our autonomy and not taking away, um, uh, you know, kind of our, our um, part of our rights of, of being a, a, the highest order of creation. Uh, it, but in, in fact, it, it's manifesting creation in that it is, it is merely just, you know, it's, it's just mathematics. It's, it's part of, of, of God's creation in, in general. Yeah, I, th- I think that's very, it's very beautiful. Um, uh, you know, and, and I, I agree that, you know, math is a tremendous gift, but my goodness, um, uh, you know, what a, what an amazing thing that I, you know, have never been great at wrapping my head around, but I've tried consistently beating my head against walls, yes. to, you know, to get, to better understand um, uh, throughout my life. But, um, you know, I, I, I don't think that we can um, concede such important um, uh, uh, questions uh, beyond human uh, human authority, I mean, it, it is a it is a human decision to to cede 
you know, our economy, for instance, to math or to a market. And I, I, I'm reminded of, you know, for instance, in, in you know, Catholic tradition, um, you know, to, to the two recent popes, you know, who are re generally thought of as kind of opposed or, you know, one is the conservative, one is the, you know, liberal or whatever, you know, Pope Benedict XVI and, and Pope Francis, uh, uh, you know, both of them um, had, I think, a really, really cogent critique of the market. You know, and, and, and it was precisely along these lines saying that, you know, a fundamental problem in our society today is we've ceded so much power to the mechanism of the market um, that we are, that we have lost our capacity to solve the fundamental moral problems of our, of our time, you know, and, and uh, those for both popes, you know, were very, very concerned about environmental crises, you know, before Pope Francis, it was Benedict was called the Green Pope. Um, and, and this goes back to, to, um, you know, the origins of modern Catholic social teaching with Pope Leo XIII, uh, in 1891 with Rerum Novarum, um, insisting that the, you know, we cannot, it is a, um, a dereliction of our duty as human beings to, um, to simply hand, uh, uh the, our societies and our economies over to, um, over to mechanistic markets. You know, we need to put um, the, the control of the economy in human hands. And that's why he called for, you know, something that I think is really relevant to, you know, something like Bitcoin, called for distributing ownership of the means of production as widely as possible. Um, you know, just the other day, I, uh, I you know, I, I saw a tweet by a, a you know, friend of mine who's a, a venture capitalist in the crypto space, you know, saying, has anybody heard of this thing, distributism? You know, this is the tradition that emerged out of Pope Leo and, and that 1891 statement that uh, political philosophy that that calls for, you know, a wide distribution of the means of production. And the reason for that is to ensure that, yes, we have markets. We love, you know, markets are wonderful things, you know, from, you know, from from the kind of contemporary digital markets to like, you know, going to a, a, a you know, if you've ever been to a market that has stood in one place in a in an in an ancient city for centuries, you know what a beautiful beautiful achievement that is. Uh, nevertheless, um, you know it has to be, um, you know we it, it's an abdication of responsibility to relinquish it, uh, to, you know to to lose control over that system, uh, because you end up with patterns like what we're seeing uh, uh, with the environmental crises, where where um, where uh, we seem. Uh, uh, unable to challenge the logic of the market um, because we're so locked in. We've ceded so much to the logic of that market, which does not have, you know, an indicator for, you know, for carbon emissions, right? Um, and, uh, uh, and, and, you know, we don't seem to be able to change course uh, where, where there is an urgent need. Um, and, and, and so I think that's the balance we need to find, you know, is, is to embrace those um, you know, embrace our math, embrace our mechanisms, embrace the possibility of, of um, you know, putting uh, uh, some forces outside human, direct human control and allowing the kind of uh, powerful flows to occur. But at the same time, you know, also having the ability to steer those, those systems when urgent needs arise, like something like the climate crisis. Um, I, I'm concerned that, you know, so far the experience with some of our, you know, our crypto systems um, seem to uh, have a similar pattern, like what those popes right now are are, are so anxious about that 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 they are um, ceding human authority, human agency to the to the machines, to the math, to a degree where, as if a crisis, an unanticipated crisis arises, um, we are unable to do anything about it. We're so locked in. We're so bought in. Um, we feel like we would lose everything if we um, if we made that change, and that's a scary place to be. I would, you know, and it's and we, we I mean, both of us, you know, uh, those listeners who don't um, who aren't familiar with Catholicism is that uh, just to kind of roll back just a little bit was um, when when popes uh, release encyclicals and and things like that is that. Um, the the concept of infallibility is not uh, is not a broad stroke on anything that they say. Um, it's usually you know, and there's been I think what only what yeah, only a handful of times it's actually been um, um, 
that the Pope's actually spoken with infallibility and it's on, on matters of faith. Um, but to, to go back for it is that when, when they do release, you know, things that I, I, you know, I, I really do um, like Rerum Novarum, uh, but that, you know, popes themselves are not uh, economists any more than biologists. And a lot of this is, you know, combined thought processes with, with, um, um, you know, various advisors and things that they have. And, and, and my reading in, of Rerum was that more of what, what he attributed to the, you know, kind of the, the, the machinations of the market was more of the adverse effects of it that that the market was um that the that the bad actors within that market you know the uh you know the employers as he would as he would call them the hard-headed um um hard-headedness of of employers uh and and their hiring and you know their labor practices and you know this was of course right at the you know the point of the industrial revolution where living conditions in most of uh, Western Europe had, had, I mean, um, quality of life and, and all that, I would, I would say overall had gone up compared to, you know, the agrarian lifestyles that they had before. But uh, there was a lot of hopelessness there with during that period of transition. Um, and, uh, you know, to me, I, I would I would think that it would be more equitable. It would be more fair um, to to trust um, the creation of money uh, in, in a financial system or the basis of a financial system um, to something that has that has, you know, rules that are, you know, set in stone, agreed upon um, and, and can't be swayed. I mean, you know, uh, there, there's no bad actors that can, you know, come in and decide to, well, you know, we want to print and, and um you know, destroy an economy. Like you see, you know, we see this in, in Venezuela. We saw this in Argentina. I mean, you saw it in Germany in the thirties uh, where these kind of the, the whims of men um, are, are much more dangerous to me uh, than, than rules that, that guide um, without, um, without favor you know, with the, with the, a math problem that guides without favor. I would, I would, to me, that would, that would seem to be a much more equitable uh, way to, to run a financial system than hoping that the people you put in charge are, are better. Well, th those are false, false uh, choices there. I mean, the, the, there's the, there's the, the, the fixed system, right. Um, that does not ever change. You know, none of these systems are quite that. Um, the, the, the question is more actually, you know, you look at Bitcoin, you could really radically change the, the, the way the Bitcoin software works. <laughs> you know, if all those miners agree, they could make some serious, serious changes. The, the problem is, is that they're incentivized not to. Um, and, uh, and so it's, it's, it's more a matter of, you know, who the stakeholders are and what the, what the economic dynamics are in, the, in a case like that. And then, you know, the alternative case where you have, human institutions in control, they're not really that different in certain respects. But in that case, you know, the, it's not just, you know, you know, we're not talking about just throwing random people into positions and hoping they do well. But it, the idea is having a system where you have, you know, direct accountability to some sort of, sort of democratic mechanism uh, where people are making those decisions um, with some sort of with accountability in various ways. Um, but but, I, you know, it, it, it's. I, I love that we can get into this, uh, uh, you know, may, may our listeners forgive us, but, um, you know, the, 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 for instance, the church has experienced like a, a, a crisis of financial uh, monetary structure before. I mean, for instance, uh, one of the great commitments of the early church was uh, against usury, which was largely understood as a pretty strict prohibition of interest charging of any kind. Um, and, uh, and so Christians really couldn't develop a financial system, uh, as we understand it today, um, in the middle ages, because this was prohibited and this was extremely problematic yet, um, needs arise such as in colonial adventures and building big churches and all sorts of things where finance, um, and, and lending, um, uh, appeared really, really necessary. And so there was this dramatic and very painful shift. Um, uh, over the course of the late Middle Ages that, 
uh, documented, um, for instance, uh, in work by Jacques Le Goff and, and you know, a number of other historians uh, about the way in which um, the, the faith was really uh, had to be, uh, you know, changed, it had to, had to really uh, radically rethink its understanding of itself. You know, the people had to rethink their understanding of their faith um, in order to accommodate this emerging financial system. You know, purgatory comes into the picture as part of this process. Um, you know, there's, there's just a, a, a series of kind of machinations about the relationship between the Medici family and the popes. And, um, uh, you know, this was all about this question of whether um, uh, of whether a financial system would be tolerated, whether the rule set that was adopted in the pre-modern era um, would be retained. And, and the system ultimately had to kind of um, bend and adapt. And, and you know, I think actually for, um, uh, uh, for a while has gone too far in just kind of embracing the amorality of finance. And now I think with Benedict and Francis, we're seeing a corrective where where. Uh, that same church is ha is having to say, oh no, wait a second, there need to be some bounds on the system. You know, it's not just an amoral thing. Maybe we were right earlier on to, um, you know, to be suspicious. Maybe Thomas Aquinas's critique of of usury, which is very very poignant, um, uh, 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 had some truth to it. Um, so, so it's it, you know, it, all these systems are you know that that when a system is fixed, it's kind of in our imaginations. And when it's bendable, it's in our imaginations. Um, and, and, and any system that human beings are, you know, can associate themselves with are always in some respect, you know, uh, vulnerable to contestation and are available for change. Um, so to me, you know, really the, the choice is, is kind of false. And the question really comes down to is when we are going to change rules, because we're going to, even, you know, that fixed prohibition on usury, which was like, you know, on the level of like how you hear Christians talk about abortion today and probably more strict. Um, uh, uh, if that could be so radically changed, you know, no system is, is, is quite so fixed. And the, the real question is, is what are the mechanisms by which we allow change to happen? Um, that to me is, I think, the interesting question. Um, and when you look at, for instance, something like Bitcoin or Ethereum or some of these different mechanisms, some of these different models we're seeing, um, uh, you know, those are the, the those are the real interesting questions about um, about the decisions being made right now. You know, I, I was stuck in a in a, a car with Vitalik Buterin a, a few months ago and, you know, just had the opportunity to talk with him a little bit about, you know, the, the anxieties they're they're working through in the Ethereum world. In trying to line up the stakeholders and create some kind of basic uh, uh, small changes to the protocol in order to solve some of the basic problems that they're encountering, um, and it's a, it's an immense undertaking. Uh, uh, but it's also you know in those questions, in those in those um, debates about like you know how are we going to you know who is really going to have power in the system? Who is the system going to be accountable to? You know, we are perhaps writing some of the, those social contracts of the future. And in the process, we're also asking ourselves, you know, how much do we trust ourselves? You know, how much do we, um, are, are we willing to, to, um, uh, uh, to rise to the occasion of taking responsibility for the wonders that we're creating? Um, and, and that to me is the kind of, you know, is the democratic question. And, and my my impulse, you know, which, and I think this is a, you know, might be our fundamental disagreement. My impulse is always to say, I would much rather us human beings rise to the occasion and figure out how best to rise to the occasion of uh, taking responsibility for the things we create, rather than retreating from that responsibility, creating uh, these wonders, and then withdrawing uh, uh, our, our direct, you know, engagement with them. I think that uh, almost in a way that we're just we're we're almost uh, uh, two sides of the same coin in in, in a way um, coming at it from from different angles because to me the um, 
coming together and and deciding, you know, verse. I, I don't see it as retreating. I, I would say that's a manifestation of of our search for doing it, uh, of of creating something um, better in in no different way than than we would do, say, with um, you know, textiles. That um, I, I would, you know, it's a much better way to have a big factory that produces bed sheets versus you know having to do it myself. That it's not retreating from from that system of creation but i mean i i guess that'll just have to be something that uh that, w- that we disagree on and I don't, I don't necessarily know if we're uh, if we're going to convince each other of uh of our positions <laughs> in one in one episode um but uh i want to be cognizant of your time i know it's it's the middle of the day and you're you're very uh gracious with um coming on um and making time your your uh, schedule uh with your family and w- was there anything that you that you wanted to talk about um, uh, in closing? Any any closing thoughts or or, uh, or about your actually your your latest book? Well, to me, you know, I think one of the really exciting transitions that I see happening right now in this crypto winter moment, you know, um, which we may be, you know, kind of it fits and starts emerging from this moment where the kind of the speculative bug- bubble burst and. And people are, you know, working very hard on a variety of projects. Is is that I've seen a lot of people turning, you know, not everybody, but a, but a lot of people in the space, especially in the Ethereum world, um, turning from this idea that we are creating an utterly new um, set of um, of social relations with these technologies, you know, and we can totally dispense with the habits of the past and the and the institutions of the past and so forth. Um, uh, uh, and more and more, I'm seeing people starting to actually get curious about things like co- the cooperative business tradition or, you know, the liberal political tradition. Um, liberal, I mean, in small L, you know, in the sense of just, you know, creating structures that have democratic accountability that, you know, uh, uh, you know allow for kind of basic rights and freedoms. Um, and, um, uh, and, 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 and to me, that's a really actually exciting pivot. Like it's, it's always cool to feel like you're starting from scratch and building something totally new, um, but it's also kind of immature. And, and, and I think we're, we have a, a maturing moment going on in some corners of the crypto world that I think is really good, where people are, are starting to recognize themselves as actually furthering those traditions um, that they, uh, of the past advancing, for instance, iterating on liberal democracy or cooperative economics or these sorts of things, um, rather than utterly departing from everything that has that has gone before. Um, and, and, and I think that's going to be um, uh, uh, that's going to be a really interesting moment. Um, one thing that I'm I'm trying to do more of is is help create relationships between people in the crypto space and people, um, you know, in government or in or in um, you know in some of these cooperatives like in credit unions you know um, and explore what might they have to learn from each other um, what are ways in which you know these experiments in in crypto can actually like bring new life to tired old credit unions what are ways in which like the really powerful amazing legacy for economic inclusion that credit unions represent can um, uh, help inform and make much more practical some of the ambitions of the of the crypto space. So, you know, a lot of it comes down to recognizing that we have traditions to build on, we have legacies, um, uh, and we're not just starting from scratch. Um, we're we're um, uh, we have an opportunity right now to uh, to advance on, build on um, some really powerful um, uh, uh, legacies. Um, so, I'm I'm excited to see that process developing. I think it's a much needed maturing and, and, um, you know, and, and I'm, I'm grateful for the chance to, to, um, do some of that too, in this conversation, um, uh, putting, you know, Bitcoin in conversation with Ray Rim Navarro, that's, that, you know, is the kind of thing that I think is, is, uh, you know, is, is, is healthy for us to be doing more. Yeah, I, I I thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah, it's it's not too often that we get to talk about uh, the the overlap in those subjects, but I I really do appreciate you uh, coming on. And how can uh, people find you? And and uh, who'd you like to hear from? Uh, well, I'm I'm you know anybody who's interested in that um, you know intersection of cooperatives and and uh, 
and crypto is always interesting to me um, and new approaches to governance and, and so forth. I'm, uh, again, a professor at the University of Colorado Boulder. I have a lab called the Media Enterprise Design Lab or Med Lab. Um, and, you know, you can find more about my work and books and articles and stuff at nathanschneider.info or uh, on Twitter at S N T N S N D R. Um, same at Social Co-op, which is a, a Mastodon instance. Um, uh, but thank you so much for, for the conversation and, and um, you know, hope, hope uh, uh, others found it useful. And I will have uh, links to uh, all the articles that we mentioned, the Rio Novarum, uh, as well as all of Nathan's books and his um, uh, social media profiles at uh, diginocrypto.com slash EP46 for episode 46. And thanks once again. All right. Thank you.